All right, guys, what are we doing? We are going to talk about some switchblade myths and a little bit of history. So, uh, but we're not going to talk about it yet. Here comes that logo. Now, we've talked about switchblades several times on the channel, but I want to get rid of some switchblade myths. Now, there are some half-truths. There are some myths that are partially true, and there's some misconceptions. So first of all, we're going to look at the switchblades history a little bit. So the first topic we're going to talk about, because the history goes with it, is the illegal knife. So um, we're going to clean some of these out of the way. I have several different. These are all switchblades. I just got them out. That's an out the side. This is an out the front. This is another out the front. I have another couple switchblades, but they're pretty much the same. So we're going to get all of them out of the way, except for the one that is the one we're going to use right now. So, are switchblades illegal? Well, that's a yes and no question. So, it's not technically a myth. There is the 1958 Switchblade Act that also covers gravity knives and several, several other things. I believe ballast songs are in there. But switchblades are not blanketly illegal. So, when I do videos about it and I get people that comment, they're like, oh, well, that's not illegal. I can carry it where I'm at. That's, that's fine. There are about 43 states where not, uh, switchblade knives are legal. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that if you go out in Ohio, you can carry this anywhere. There are also – so here's how it works. Federal laws uh, can be superseded by state and local laws, hence the, you know, the marijuana laws. Um, it's still federally legal. Now, state and – state laws can then be superseded and be made more stringent f than um, – than say uh, state laws. So just because they're legal every, in Ohio does not mean that there's not cities where they are legal or counties where they are, county ordinance, city ordinances. Those things all play into this. So why do I say that yes and no? Well, it goes back to the 1958 Switchblade, the Federal Switchblade Act is what it was called. Uh, and it was written by a senator named Sidney Yates, but it was based on a lot of fake fallacies. So um, you know, it was based on inflammatory reporting, racial biases. Actually, it was um, Puerto Rican and Mexican gangs. Uh, Italians used the Italian style stiletto. So the first switchblades that started coming to the country were out the side, the like the Italian style stiletto, which got synonymous with gang violence, mafia violence. It was also used by Mexican and Puerto Rican street gangs and, and low income groups. And so it was really easy to to vilify it. But even before the 1958 switchblade ban started, there was something that happened. Um, in 1950, there was an article that came out in the uh, – I think it was the Women's Home Companion was what it was. But it was ghostwritten for Harry S. Truman. He wanted this to become an issue. He wanted to have an issue that he could run on and take care of and, and propose legislation to look like he was doing something. So it was written for him by Jack H. Pollock, and that – was an article called The Toy That Kills. Now, to quote it directly, it's it's uh, th it was vilified. This is a direct quote. I, and I'll put it – I'll put a, a picture of it up on the side. It's described as designed for violence, deadly as a revolver. That's the switchblade. The toy youngsters are – the toy youngsters are taking up as a new fab. Press the button on this new version of the pocket knife and the blade darts out like a snake's tongue. Action against this killer should be taken now. So that kind of inflamed the reputation of the switchblade because it was in the family home journal. And then in the 50s, because there was such a buzz about it, they started getting a lot of play in movies like Rebel Without a Cause and things like that, which made it a lot easier because of popular culture to vilify the item that really was not such a big deal. This knife is no more it, it doesn't pose any more of a risk than any other knife. As a matter of fact, sometimes they're a little bit more complicated. But that really didn't matter. So the 1950s, all those movies made it easier for then, like I said, for representative – state representative Sidney Yates to sign and get into action, to write and get into action, the 1958 Switchblade Bill. So the fact is, are they illegal? Yes, on federal lands, these are illegal. If you go to um, – if you go to a military installation, if you go to any federal property, you go to a uh, an Indian reservation, like if you go to a casino on an Indian reservation, this knife is 100% illegal there. Now, 
There is no federal statute against owning and carrying your personal, in your own personal life, a switchblade. But you have to look at state and local. I mean, I had somebody say, well, they're, le- they're legal in my state. And I was like, that's great. Are they legal in your city? Are they legal in your county? Are they legal in your town? You know, there's three, there's so many different levels of legislation. So are they legal? Yes and no. So it's not a myth. They actually are illegal some places, legal other places. This is one of the most uh, controversial items you could purchase in the knife community. So there you go. Legalities, yes and no. Okay, the next big uh, fallacy. On this, it's not an issue, um, but one of the big things that people have said for years is, well, switchblades are dangerous because you can just put it up against somebody and push the button and the knife goes in. Not true. So this is, and I know we've covered a lot of this, for, but I wanted to do it in a different version. I didn't think that video did. I didn't think I described things as well. On and out the side, you obviously know that's not true. So that kind of a myth has, has been pe- perpetuated against the out the front. Now, out the front does have a fairly stiff action. You can hear it. That snaps. That sounds like there's a lot of power behind that. But in all actuality, there really is not. So in here is a sled that you have to push forward and you're you're lengthening the spring. These springs are under very little compression at rest. That's why the double action uh, out the front is a very reliable um, action for switchblades because that spring isn't degrading. It's not constantly compressed or it's not constantly stretched. You are applying the tension that's going to cause it. You can see it. And it reaches a point where it slides out. But that sled is also designed to disengage. So this is just a thin piece of cardboard stock. I ordered some more coffee. I got a thank you from Jeremy over at quartering for it. And you can see that when I deploy that knife, it I don't it did go through just ever so slightly, but that's just cardstock. And then you would have to go back and reset that in its sled because it has a built-in disengaging system. Even if it didn't, that spring in there is not that strong that it would cause all that much damage. Like it literally barely breaks through. So that is a complete fallacy. We can try it on this one as well. This has got a little shorter spring. I doubt if it even goes as far. That didn't even make it through. So this one, even weaker. So that fallacy of being able to put that against someone like this, you put it up against them and you deploy the knife and maybe you get that much. Maybe. Is it going to hurt? Probably. Is it going to cause irreparable damage? No. And then the fact is when you do that, your knife has been like, you lost your chance to deploy that knife. You have then have to either, either pull that out or flick it out to get it back engaged with the with the sled. So no, you absolutely cannot do that. That is a big fallacy. That's a big thing. That's one of the things that it's a misconception about these knives and they've been vilified for things that are not true. Now, I will say, uh, back to the legalities, uh, I, I meant to mention this, I forgot. I wanna throw this in. You can't ship these through the US Postal Service, through a federal service, and you can't sell these. Like I could not take this knife and sell it across state lines myself. Um, you can through vendors and things like that. US, UPS and FedEx are not restricted from shipping these. So there's, there you go. There's with that. But yeah, no, absolutely not. You cannot put this up against someone and deploy it and have it make any amount of damage at all. Very little. Let's try it with this one again. Like I said, right up against this one's got a little bit stronger spring. Yeah, like that. That's all you got. And that's, that's paper. That's paper. That's not clothing and a person. So there you go. Absolutely false. Let's go to the next one. Okay. This next one is every bit as silly as the last one. There is a lot of people like, well, you can't have those. The reason they're illegal and the reason that people don't want you to have them is because you can convert that into a ballistic knife. Then they just have the blade fly out. False. Uh, First of all, you couldn't do this. You couldn't do it on this one anyway, because it runs on a pivot and stuff like that. But on these... There is a catch in here that prevents the blade from falling out. It prevents it. Well, it prevents it when it flies out from going any further, but it's also what holds the blade in place here. So if you did, if you were to modify this knife to do what they're talking about, 
You would have to modify it in a way that if you did this, the blade would fall out. It doesn't, it's not practical. Could you do it in theory? Yes, but we already determined there's not a lot of strength there with that spring. I know that we saw it in the, in the, to, in the, in the Thomas Jane Punisher movie where he takes the, the switchblade out and he, 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 you know, has modified it and it's an out the front and the blade comes out. But it's not possible to do with these. Ballistic knives are completely different. They run either on a, a compressed air cartridge or uh, an explosive primer and it fires the blade out like a gun, hence ballistic knife. This cannot be converted to a ballistic knife. Um, somebody said, well, somebody said one time, well, what about the Halo series? Now, Halo series is a single action. And what happens with that is when you push the button, the spring is compressed down here and you push the button and the blade comes out under compressed spring tension. You don't have to push forward. It stays compressed all the time. And then to reset it, you have to push that button lock and pull a lever back like it would be back here. And you pull the blade back, it locks, you let your finger off, and then you push the, the carrier back forward. Even with those, and they are much stronger, you're not going to have enough power to, to reliably send that blade out and have it be a dangerous weapon of any sort. So, you know... It, the whole thing of the of people converting them and things like that has nothing to do with why they were in the the switch blade ban. Switch blade ban. So there's a lot of things that happen. A lot of things get said, and they're not always true. And especially, you definitely can't do it with one of these because if you did, well, you'd have to cut it loose from the pivot, and it just wouldn't work. So can you turn them into a ballistic knife? No, absolutely a fallacy. Completely fake. All right, this this next one is funny and. It, it, this one blurs the line between truth and fa and and fallacy because uh, balisongs have gotten thrown in with this. Balisongs kind of got added to an illegality thing because it was nanny state stuff. People were hurting themselves and things like that. That's a lot of the reason why balisongs are 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 on that list of things that you can't purchase and legalities. Uh, a lot of people were hurting themselves with it, so it was a nanny state thing. But this one is that switchblades are more dangerous than a regular knife. And it's absolutely not true. A knife is a knife is a knife. They have the same overall components. They have the same overall, you know, you have a blade, you have a handle, you have a method of deployment. They're no different. They are not more dangerous. If anything, I would say that limiting switchblades, especially like this, people that have got jobs, uh, case in point, I have a very good friend. He's a lineman. He loves a push button auto side opener because he wears heavy gloves. He's a lineman. He's dealing with electricity. He wears electrical resistant gloves. So now we've, we've limited something he could use because then all he has to do is he can push the button. He can push this up against these pants, close it, and, and he's good because the spring is what's holding it open. Like he can just do this. He doesn't have to manipulate anything. It's pretty good for him. So he likes these, but now we've limited it because of this thought that they were more dangerous, but they're not. They are basically the same. This knife is no more dangerous than any other knife. Neither is this one. Neither is this one. Neither is this one. So the whole thought that switchblades were more dangerous all just comes back to that, that 1950s glorification of them in movies like Rebel Without a Cause. Um, you could see them. They were used in plays. They were used in, uh, in, in movies like throughout history. They've been used and vilified in movies. And so no, absolutely not any more dangerous than any other knife you would ever own. And the final myth is that they're faster than other knives to play. Well, if you've got a slip joint where it's a two-hand opener, yes, absolutely. But I have to tell you, this is no faster than that. It really isn't. And anybody that tells you, oh, well, Switchblade gives you the edge, I kind of think they're a little bit more unreliable. I do believe that this is a more reliable knife. Overall, there's less moving parts, and it's no faster. The deployment on this knife and this knife is no faster. When you make that conscious thought to deploy the knife or the conscious thought to deploy this knife, it's the same. There is nothing at play. This knife is every bit as fast as this one. And anybody that tells you that it's different and this is so much faster and that therefore it makes it a better offensive weapon and it's it's better because it's, it's one-handed opening, well, so is this. That's one-handed opening 
as is this. So there's no difference between the two. The reliability of a switchblade, if I was going to carry a switchblade, it would probably be an out the side. I have the out the fronts because they're fun and get you. But let's let's look here. If if I'm carrying this for the for deployment, um, for reliability to deployment, if I have an OTF, as we saw, an OTF is going to stop when it hits Mr. Chicken here. This is going to stop when it hits Mr. Chicken here. However, it's going to continue to deploy. So if you're looking for one for ease of deployment, get it out the side. Get it out the side. Um, the 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 switchblades that came around in the 50s were the Italian stiletto style, and they were not very well-made knives. As a matter of fact, I've seen videos about them and stuff like that. Most of them weren't even sharpened. They were considered uh, like an artistic piece in Italy. They really weren't that popular until the 50s. Like the Italian, st the Italian st uh, switchblade stiletto market did not kick off until after World War II when Americans found them. They found them attractive. They found them fun. They were kind of something cool to bring back. They were better than the, than the, the, than the autos that they were getting uh, issued to them. They were a lot, they had a better look. They looked foreign. And when they came back to the States, that really kicked off the boom. And so I absolutely think that all of these knives that we've talked about, all the autos, they've gotten a bad rap. It's unfair, and we need to get rid of that. Which brings me to a point. If you are not a Knife Rights member, you have no room to complain about people taking away your rights to these items. So with that being said, that's the end of the video. We're going to turn this around. I'm going to do a couple final thoughts, and we'll send you out about your day. I hope you enjoyed this. I've wanted to do this. Um, again and readdress and, and maybe make it a little clearer to everyone uh, the points I was trying to make in the first video. But, you know, sometimes sometimes we just don't get our point across the way we want. So let's get out of here. So there you go, guys. There was five switchblade myths. And I know I did a video like this before, but I really wasn't happy with it. And I'd like improving the content. And if I can do another video where I maybe do it a little bit better and explain it a little bit better, I'm always up for that. So like I said, I like switchblades. I don't think that there's any real reason to vilify them, but the fact is there are some people out there that disagree and a lot of it is based on just misconceptions. So that's it on this one, guys. If you like the videos, give them a thumbs up. If you don't like them, give them a thumbs down. Please try to tell me why. I can't change the content if you don't tell me what you don't like. If you want to support the channel with the simplest like, share, subscribe, hit the bell icon. If you do hit the bell icon, make sure you've got notifications turn on your device so you get notified of everything that goes up. If you want to support the channel financially, however, I think I mentioned it mid-roll of the video, there are a bunch of affiliate links down below. That's how I self-sponsor the channel. Anything you purchase through those affiliate links directly supports the channel. It doesn't cost you anything at checkout. And there's a lot of good stuff down there, including the Amazon stuff where it doesn't matter if it's not the item you clicked on. Anything you purchase after you use my affiliate link, I still get credit for it. Otherwise, you can do it. I have got a membership down below. It is tier-based, but remember, everyone saves $5 off my sharpening service. Everyone has access to my Gilded server. Premium and baseline tier members automatically get entered into a giveaway I do on the Gilded server. And the premium members have access to a YouTube sharpening tutorial series that I've built specifically for them. Um, all the tiers are based, but everyone enjoys the Gilded server. And the final way is I have merchandise store on Ember Shirt Co., uh, I've set up a coupon code that works anywhere on Ember Shirt Code that will save you 10% at checkout. That coupon code is Crazy Sharp, all one word, capital C, capital S, Crazy Sharp. Saves you 10% at checkout. And if you take pictures of you wearing my merchandise, I will put them in a video. Guys, that's it. I love you all. Keep it clean in the comment section. If it's your birthday, happy birthday. Tomorrow's my birthday. You guys are watching this on Monday. And I will see you in the next video.